it's not about me as the elected official. It's about what happens to the communities. Redistricting is about money, power, and access. Both parties try to get an advantage. The shoe can be on the other foot and maybe a catalyst for more honest and open discussions about reforming the process so that it works better for everyone. We are growing and diversifying every single day. And not only is it about how these maps get drawn, it's about the people. Who's going to show up thinking their voice is going to count? Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution lays out that elections to the House of Representatives will be held every two years, and the number of delegates will be apportioned amongst the states according to their relative populations. The framers fought bitterly over the number, but eventually agreed that no single representative should represent more than 30,000 people, and each state should have at least one rep. Nowhere, not once in the entire document, does anyone use the word district. It's a point worth underscoring because today the districting or redistricting process has become highly contentious and often blatantly partisan. And the most powerful players in party politics sometimes seem reluctant to do anything about it. At this point in the cycle, slightly more than half of all the states have completed their districting and redistricting process. They've drawn their maps, but it's not too late for the public to get involved. Indeed, new technology is making it easier for citizens groups to draw up their own maps. Today, we talk with four people with personal experience in the redistricting process. Stephen Holmes, the commissioner for Precinct 3 in Galveston County, Texas, has held office for 23 years and he's about to lose his precinct because of redistricting. Keila Crane, a Michigan resident and an attorney, is also a social justice advocate who is the redistricting committee chair for Delta Sigma Theta, one of the first black sororities. Carly Hare of the Pawnee Yankton Nation is the chair of the Colorado Independent Redistricting Commission and the first executive director of Culture Surge, an arts-based coalition focused on justice and democracy. And finally, Michael Lee is the Senior Counsel of Democracy for the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University. Welcome, everybody. What an eminent crew. Um, I, I guess I'll start with you, Michael. You say it often enough, and it, it, you have a hard time remembering that it has to do with actual people. Um, so just tell us what redistricting really is. And I'm right in saying it's not in the Constitution, right? Well, that's right. Um, it, it is not in the Constitution. The reapportionment of seats among the states is something that happens every 10 years after the census. But um, redistricting is something that um, we started doing um, just to make sure that districts are equally populated and now that they comply with other requirements of law, such as the, the Voting Rights Act, and so it's supposed to be for a good purpose. It's supposed to make sure that we're representative. And, you know, as John Adams said at the beginning of the country, um, le legislatures, Congress should be an exact portrait, a miniature of the people as a whole. And that's really the idea that if you're interested at the table, then so should you be. Um, unfortunately, you know, almost from the very beginning of the country, uh, people figured out a way to put their thumb on the scale, to draw districts in a way that favored themselves or their party or and punish their political opponents and discriminated against people that they don't like. And that's something that even predates the term gerrymandering. Um, you know, Patrick Henry of give me liberty or give me death fame. I was governor of Virginia when the, the state drew its very first congressional map. And he um, hated a man named James Madison and tried to make it impossible for James Madison to win election to Congress. He wasn't successful, but it, this goes to show you that even the framers wanted to do this. And it's and unfortunately something that's gotten much worse with data technology. Um, but it's been with us a long time, and it's been something that we've really struggled to get right. Kayla, to you, is there anything you would add to this picture? You also have been involved at a professional level in trying to kind of assess what's fair, what's not, what's serving the the purpose of fair representation in this ostensible or aspiring to be country of a democracy. Thank you, Laura, for having uh, Dr. Stigma Theta here. 
uh, to talk about redistricting. We are um, a predominantly black um, historically uh, sorority. So we're very concerned about um, equity uh, in the redistricting process, making sure that uh, communities of color, black communities in particular are not splintered in the redistricting process, ensuring that um, those communities are not uh, split amongst many different uh, districts or compact into one singular district as to minimize uh, their electoral strength. And so we have been um, training our members across the country for many years about uh, looking at those maps and, and being very strategic about how those uh, maps are drawn so that communities of color are able to elect candidates of their choice um, so that everybody does have a seat at the table when you're talking about electing representatives, not just on the congressional or even state level, but making sure that people know this goes all the way down to uh, the school board level, city council, county council. And so all of those levels, we're looking to making sure that everybody does have an equal um, and equitable voice uh, when it comes to selecting their representatives um, and elected officials. But, I mean, Carly, coming to you, you have been part of an independent commission. How did that come into effect? And what are the role, What are the many roles that people, regular folks, can play in all of this? Because it's regular folks' votes. And I'm imagining in Colorado, especially indigenous people's votes that came out so visibly and effectively in the last election cycle that are going to be targeted. Well, I would just, on that note, as, a, as an indigenous woman, navigating the politics of this country, there is always a dissonance around watching our traditional homelands be um, represented in ways that don't uh, map our core values and our community values. Um, so it definitely was interesting being able to sit in that chair. And I think specifically in Colorado, and like many states, we are, uh, our communities are changing. In Colorado, the number of voting age people of color increased significantly from the last census map to the census map. We also increased in the number of people that came into the state uh, in, that, in that space as well. We also have um, a number of people who are, I think, uh, disenfranchised uh, in many ways. So Colorado has a breakdown of roughly 28% Democrats, 25% Republicans, and then 44% uh, independent um, in the state. Like we are uh, severely gray in many ways. And to Michael's point, you can find out what that gray is uh, with sophisticated maps of, of the unaffiliated. But our process was set up to try to address some of those issues, to address the maps, because we had three consecutive redistricting cycles that went to the state Supreme Court because the legislature couldn't decide on one. So it was this centering of partisanship was challenging. The center of elected officials making those decisions, I think, was uniquely what made Colorado stand out differently. It's why the amendments were put into place. I think it's partially led to why 70 plus percent of our voters voted to support these amendments. And the way that we were, we are one of 10 in the country that have independent redistricting that do, don't have political represent, political uh, officer representation. So our tenor, and we look all very different across the 10 of what that looks like. But Colorado set up a three, three and three, or a four, four, and four model. So four Republicans, four um, Democrats, and four unaffiliated um, voters. And, um, and through that, we also had a, a voting process that was very clear. You had to have at least two unaffiliated voters uh, of your mix and have at least eight people of our 12 be able to vote something uh, into place most often. Um, and, and, and some of the core key decisions, it had to be 10 of the vote, 10 of our uh, commission's members had to vote for it with the two unaffiliated markers in there. Um, but I think to your to the the uh, art of the core question really is we are struggling. We are struggling in this country for power and access and influence. And we are uh, growing and diversifying every single day and what that looks like. And yet the laws and systems we have in place um, are, have been manipulated or have always or have never been clear about supporting that, have always supported a dominant white cultural framework to lead in this space. And so there is a lot of systems change work that we need to think about. And not only is it about how these maps could get drawn, but it's about the people who's going to show up thinking their voice is going to count. Well, this is very contested territory and it has been from the very beginning. And, and I wanna come back to you, Michael, on this. You mentioned gerrymandering, gerrymandering. Gerrymander was actually a person as I understand it. Um, what is it? Um, and then, you know, it's important that we consider the origins of our data 
uh, and you mentioned that the census plays a big role in this. And we just took a census in the middle of a pandemic with a president terrifying all sorts of people from participating. I might not be, I'm, I hope I'm not putting it too strongly. Michael. Well, you know, gerrymandering is uh, the term that we use to describe political manipulation of maps in this country. And it comes from uh, a map in Massachusetts that Governor Elbridge Gerry signed um, in 1812 that many people thought was really egregious. But yet, if you look at the map today, it's like not not nearly as bad as some of the maps that are being drawn nowadays. Um, but that's it became it looked like a salamander. So people called it a gerrymander and, it, it, and that term stuck. Um, and it's gerrymandering is something that has uh, been with us really from the very beginning of the country, but it is something that is getting worse because um, in the past when you drew maps, you did it by hand and you could draw three or four or five maps and you pick the best one that accomplished your goals out of the three or four or five maps. But now with computers and much more robust data, you're able to draw maps with much more micro precision. You could draw hundreds of thousands of maps using supercomputers in a matter of days. And then you could pick out of the best of those. You also have much more data about voters uh, based on you know what kind of car you drive, where you shop, um, what you're posting on Facebook or Instagram. People can construct really robust models about who you are, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, how robust a Democrat or Republican you are, um, whether you vote in the midterms or just in the presidential years. And with that data, you're able to draw maps that really do stick, that really do accomplish what you want. Um, and, and that is you know really remarkable. And so for example, in a state like Texas, you know, there, there were under the old map, um, Texas had 11 districts and Donald Trump won by 11 or more or 15 or more points in 2020. Now there are 21 such districts, right? They, they've made all of the districts that they hold in Texas much more super Trump districts. Um, and, and Texas didn't really rely on a lot of big data or anything like that, but you, you can use big data to do that. Um, and th that's really a very anti democratic, small d, pernicious sort of thing that is occurring around the country. You just mentioned Texas. I want to throw to a conversation I had earlier this week with County Commissioner Stephen Holmes from Precinct 3 in Galveston, who is one of those people who has served many years in the only black, you know, multiracial district in his county. He's the sole black Democrat in the county. And because of redistricting, he would say, I think, probably gerrymandering, um, he's about to lose his district. Um, Let's hear what he has to say. Talk about how this happened. In 2013, the Supreme Court in uh, Shelby versus Holder made a change to the Voting Rights Act and ended the, the federal preclearance requirement for changes right. like this to the districting maps of, of communities like yours. Right. What happened where you are? What happened in 2000, the 2011 redistricting cycle prior to Shelby County was uh, obviously got uh, uh, Counties like Galveston in the state of Texas had to submit their maps for pre-clearance to the Justice Department. There was a map submitted by the Galveston County Commissioner's Court that did much of the same thing um, to Precinct 3, my precinct. Um, the Justice Department kicked it back and said, no, this is not a good map. It dilutes the strength of minorities within this precinct. And the Commissioner's Court had to go back and redraw a new map. And, and fast forward to Shelby County, 2013, um, which strikes down the pre-clearance requirement. Galveston County goes through the redistricting process, which wasn't much of a process in 2021. There's no need to pre-clear. And so they pass the map, any map that they want. I think what people need to, we need to know about certainly redistricting and who it affects, uh, um, I'm Lord, to be quite honest with you, it's not about me as the elected official, it's about the community and what happens to the communities. I mean, elected officials come and go, but powers that are given to, to certain communities and, and the pride that they have, if you look at us, here in Galveston County, there's so much pride in Galveston County amongst the people. You know, Galveston was, was the birth of Juneteenth. You know, where, where, the Juneteenth, that's where it happened in Galveston, uh, uh, in Galveston County, Texas. So there's a lot of pride there. You know, there are many of the first in Texas. The first African-American Baptist church in Texas was in Galveston. The first black high school was in Galveston. The first county park was in Galveston, so, in Texas. So it, there's a lot of pride, and there's a lot of pride in people there. And when I first took office, to be honest with you, Laura, there were people who would who 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 were dis, uh, who, who who when they were born they had living ancestors who were born into slavery, um, Laura. So and, and then you take all that 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 forward and they, they lived through they lived through all the depression and, and the, the civil rights era and they lived through all that and to see all this come back and get the clock turned back on all of these things and all these gains that these communities have made and that that people within 
the precinct have seen, seen transpire and take place, it is, a, it is a huge blow. What recourse do you have? I understand there's a lawsuit. Yeah, yeah, but that's the, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, 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 the that's, that's what the problem gets created without the voting, these, the, without preclearance, because you have jurisdictions like mine, I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands of them who are experiencing the exact same thing that we're experiencing in Galveston County. So the only recourse is without the Justice Department preclearance, the only recourse is a uh, federal uh, uh, lawsuit, and that's it. And so yeah, there will be lawsuits, uh, I'm sure uh, hopefully more will come, hopefully the Justice Department will come down and file lawsuits as well on behalf of the citizens of Galveston County um, to try to rectify this change. Or if, 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 if nothing else, it would, it would be, I would love to see Congress pass voting rights legislation that would stop this and, and, and reinstate the, the preclearance aspect of the Voting Rights Act. Commissioner Stephen Holmes, I wish you absolute luck and uh, we'll be watching and thank you for taking some time to be with us today. Thank you for your time and thanks for having me, Laura. Thank you. So is there recourse at the federal level? Back to the Brennan Center's Michael Lee. Federal courts in recent years have increasingly become not the place to go in order to seek redress for harms that occur in redistricting. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court has gutted um, key provisions of the Voting Rights Act in multiple decisions. It may further carve back on what's left of the Voting Rights Act in a case that the court will hear next October coming out of Alabama regarding whether that state has an obligation to create a second Black uh, opportunity district in its congressional map or not. But likewise, the Supreme Court has greenlit partisan gerrymandering by saying that partisan gerrymandering doesn't violate the U.S. Constitution, or at least that you can't bring those claims in federal court. And that really has opened the door to a lot of racial discrimination, because what you're seeing around the South in particular is Republican map drawers defending maps saying, oh, well, we were just discriminated against Democrats. And yes, they happen to be Black, Latino, and Asian, but we weren't discriminating against them because of their race. We were just trying to target Democrats. And you, the Supreme Court, have said that that's perfectly okay. And, and you know, it may turn out that the Supreme Court in Greenlighting partisan gerrymandering really has as much ended up in greenlighting racial discrimination because we're seeing that around the country, it's state after state after state. Redistricting is about money, power, and access. And uh, this is uh, why we're really intentional about looking at these maps, looking how they're drawn, making sure that um, when they are drawn, that we are looking at not only just the compactness, but also where people are living um, so that we can provide that additional insight. Uh, to the map uh, making process. It's been um, tremendously impactful for us uh, to have access to free mapping software so that our members are able to go into those, um, into those softwares, look at their own cities, their own states, and try to devise a map on their own so that they can see how a map could be drawn that is um, consistent with the traditional um, map making um, procedures, but as well as ensuring that communities communities of color um, are not split because while there is an argument, uh, particularly on the Republican side, but uh, that uh, they're just trying to advantage um, uh, their own political party, um, but we all know that overwhelmingly communities of color in this country vote Democratic. And so there is a kind of a red herring to say that we're just trying to advantage our Republicanness when you can see by how um, specific lines are drawn, how you curve around this area of this, um, this city that is richly dense in communities of color, how it's fractured in many different uh, ways that it's not just trying to advantage their political party, but it's also looking at who lives there and a splintering them um, accordingly. And so it, it's, um, we are looking at, like I said, we're looking at it from a racial um, and an ethnic lens, but not, but not being uh, deceived that there is a political um, aspect to it as well. The, the, to the way that this redistricting story is told is not the way that would engage most people. And yet I, I am hearing in what you all have to say and the involvement of the sorority and movement groups like the ones you represent, that there is a way for regular folks to get involved and that they are getting involved. I'm hearing a lot about, what is it called? Dave's redistricting. Mm -hmm. um, Carly, you want to come in on that? Definitely. We, we were very clear and transparent. Every single one of our meetings had to be public meetings. Uh, we had 
Davis redistricting up before even the census information was up for people uh, to submit maps. 75 independent maps were submitted by individuals uh, through the process. We had over 5,000 independent individual comments that were submitted through our portal about just general thoughts on redistricting as well as the specific maps. And, and we did 40 public hearings um, during pandemic times. So half of them are in person or about a third of them are in person and a third were remote um, mixture, mixture of what that looked like. Um, but we spoke to over a thousand individuals in that process. I think I think the census number, the census process in the last this this decennial was challenging in many ways. However, I feel there was such a strong outcry from community organizations, from local, state, and national philanthropy to make sure that the census process was supported by trusted community partners to make sure we were getting to particularly uh, communities of color and underrepresented voices um, and communities that may have felt threatened by how it was laid out in the process. So it was key to have those partners on the ground in that space. It will be key for the for our for us to reach true multicultural democracy to continue to not only work on redistricting, but in these uh, voter restrictive laws that are coming into states, because as you compound these challenges, it looks different for my aunties and my uncles and my my uncles and my cousins about feeling like they even need to show up at all if the system is so hard against them. And that's why, uh, for me, the chairing of this process led to a career shift. I am now shifting my role to sit in supporting um, people to engage in political process through, through storytelling, through cultural organizing, through collective narratives, um, and narratives that aren't about uh, centering the democracy that we've created. Uh, and then the structure of the democracy, but centering how we be, how we are in community together and how we can be better in community together. Running out of time, I just want to let both Michael and, and Keela in. Michael, quickly, anything you want to add about how people can get engaged? Well, I think, you know, last decade, we saw a record amount of reform, a record six states enacted some form of redistricting reform. And a, a lot of that was citizen-led in Michigan, uh, everyday citizens got together and collected about 500,000 signatures and put something on the ballot and push for reform. Likewise, people are getting out there um, proposing maps, commenting on maps, and it's much easier to do today than it was in the past because you can go online and, and draw your maps. You can go online and analyze maps. You can go, go online and look at maps and and and, 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 and you know, be prepared to comment. And, and so it's much easier today than it was in the past. So technology in some ways is making gerrymandering worse, but technology is also giving people a seat at the table that they didn't have before. And when the Delta Sigma Theta sorority gets involved, I think your days are numbered, right, Kayla? <laughs> we will absolutely hold you to account, absolutely. And so um, Delta, I'm very proud of my members who have been getting engaged in this process. You can go on our Facebook page, um, which is DNC. DSTINC 1913, we created a redistricting after dark series uh, to talk to various people that are involved with redistricting to kind of break it down um, and help people understand what redistricting is and how it impacts them. And then give them the resources with our friends in the civil rights community like Michael, um, Southern Coalition for Social Justice, the LDF, NAACP, who have a, a plenty of resources to help you understand redistricting. Because again, this will happen once again in 2031. And so there's plenty of time for you to read up on it and understand it so that you can get involved um, uh, in any level with redistricting um, next go around. Great. Thank you all so much. Early voting in the first 2022 primary elections that take place in Texas began this month, with new voter ID laws causing ballots to be returned in massive numbers and new districts drawn, like Stephen Holmes's. At the same time, we're seeing in that same state an upsurge in citizen and civilian activity. Residents are getting involved, both to reclaim their election process and to change it, especially new residents, newcomers to the state, who see a future in that red place that looks a whole lot more blue. Is it a problem for more people to get involved in our democracy? 
for less reliance to be put on our parties and the offices of state? I don't think so. You can listen to the full uncut conversation by subscribing to our podcast, which is available at our website. Thanks for watching. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura.